Hey y'all, Data Guy here. And today, I have a kind of your request video and something that I thought was a good idea, which is making kind of a video just on best practices for setting up the file structure and organizing your projects. Um, so it's not something I really ever delve into on my videos because I just have these project directories kind of already set up and I'm kind of doing it pretty slapdash. But I realized probably shouldn't be uh, advertising that as a kind of best way of doing things. I do have more organization outside of just kind of what I show in these videos. And I also have a little bit of knowledge from the companies I work with of, hey, you know, this is what large organizations do to organize their repositories, keep everything in, tra in track. So that's what I'm going to show you today. Um, so I'm going to kind of, as the basis for this, I'm going to use just my local setup, show you how I would set up a new project. I'll use Airflow as the core just because I think that has a nice clean setup for including everything in it and typically Airflow will be the central nervous system of you know my data stacks. So what I'm going to do is show you how to set up a local Airflow environment, not really focus on setting up the Airflow environment, just show you the file structure and then show you how I build out that environment uh, to my own specifications, bringing other scripts and then also operationalizing it. You know, how do I bring in multiple repositories? How can I set up some basic testing? How can I set up some CI CD processes, uh, dockerize things to make sure everything's standardized and have just a really easy workflow where, hey, I can, you know, test things, uh, push them, save, give myself checkpoints so that I can go off, try and test new things. If they break, no worries, I can revert back to a previous checkpoint, um, even if I've completely screwed up my whole project. So without further ado, Let's get into it. So first thing I just want to show you guys is kind of how I have everything set up. So I have basically two major directories for my repositories. I have this is my desktop, I mean, obviously aside from the screenshots, I have my Airflow repositories, data guy repositories. So here, then my data guy repositories, I have them segmented either by project or by tool that I'm using. So, you know, all my Flink scripts are in a folder for Flink. Uh, all my Kafka scripts are in a folder for Kafka. Obviously you know, I can copy and move these scripts anywhere, but for Flink and Kafka especially, since you're typically just running that environment as part of the script, you don't need to have all the operational stuff that you need to like actually provision Kafka alongside of it, because um, you can reference that in the script, and it also makes it a lot cleaner when you're not just looking through all like the kind of uh, just like basic system level files that you just need to run Kafka on your local machine. Um, so I find this is a pretty effective way of organizing things because then, you know, hey, I just look in here, look at my Spark scripts, go back over my past work. But if I want to go look at an independent project that is a little more complex, like an end-to-end -end project, then it has its own repository. So <clears throat> when I'm creating a new one, what I'll do first is go into Terminal um, and then zoom in a little bit more. C, so ls first, cd into my desktop, it's here and then cd into um, my data guy repos and then make directory best practices sample cd in there and then what i'm going to do here is just run astro dev init and what this will do is just create a file basic kind of skeleton file structure of a dockerized airflow environment which brings me to my first thing always use docker if possible um, and you know, it doesn't need to be Docker, it can be another image provider. Docker is just kind of the gold standard. Um, but the reason why is because if you have everything Dockerized, you can customize your images really easily through their respective Docker files. So you know, here I'm pulling in a base Airflow image, but if let's say I want to start installing some uh, DBT environments here, right? I want to bring in a DBT virtual environment. Um, I want to run that on my machine. So I'm actually going to customize uh, this to start using dbt um, and so this allows you to have a kind of standardized template for any customizations you make for to your environment if you're just doing these within the docker shell or the docker exec you know going in after you spun up the container then you have to do that every time you're starting up a new docker engine every time you restart the project just super annoying and there's also nothing to keep track of the changes you made so you might forget oh wait I had to install this one package to make everything work, and then the next time, or someone else tries to try your project, they don't know to do that. Um, and so it makes it really hard to replicate work if you don't have everything kind of templatized and dockerized into these images. Um, and then, of course, you'll have something like, for almost every file or thing, you'll have a requirements.txt if you're dockerizing it. Um, and this is, again, really helpful um, because 
when you're installing Python packages on your local machine, you know, you're installing them in a kernel, you can have multiple different versions of Python running. Um, and something I even run to my local machine is I don't know which version of Python has which packages installed. Uh, and so what having a requirements.txt in a Dockerized Python environment allows you to do is know exactly what Python packages are in there uh, in that specific Docker environment. Um, so you're not actually just kind of fussing around, going like, hey, you know, what package is my Snowflake provider in? Um, you know, here you can add in all your providers that you need, um, you know, like Pandas, and then know, okay, so when I spin up this Python environment, it has all these packages already installed in there, and then you can also, you know, host provider packages online if you need if you need uh, more advanced ones or custom packages. And then it also allows you to have multiple different sets of requirements files. So if you want to quickly switch out, hey, you know, maybe you have some conflicts between two different sets of requirements, having those two different requirement files allows you to easily switch between those two use cases without a ton of friction and a ton of lost time, actually just like, hey, now I got to recustomize this environment, recustomize it back. If you're using, every, if everything's dockerized into virtual machines and then you have the requirements as set text files, it's really easy to keep track of what requirements are in which environment. Now, within your environment, Within a larger project, what I also like to do is segment everything by subfolders by their use case. So within this DAGs folder, let's say you know I have some MLOps DAGs. I would want to create a folder for MLOps use cases. Then I have another folder for data analytics, not file, folder for analytics, right? And this just gives you a top level logic to say, hey, you know, every DAG within this directory is of X class. And this also gives you the capability later on to automatically assign tags to every DAG within a particular folder because you can have logic based off of whether or not a DAG is within that folder. Um, and then also just visually, it's what I find to be the best way of organizing it uh, because it allows you to say, hey, you know, I'm, if I'm working on this use case, I'm probably gonna be working on a couple different DAGs within that use case, but largely staying within that kind of slice of the business. So that's why I like to organize it by the actual use case of the DAG. Now, another thing that's important to also set up is a testing framework. So here you'll notice under this test DAGs folder, we have this DAG example test. And this is something that, you know, it's great to have the, you know, just kind of basic pie test, but also standardizing your own testing logic. So, you know, this test will make sure that, hey, uh, are there any import errors? Do all the DAGs that are running, do they have all the packages that they actually need? Um, are there, uh, are there parameters in DAGs? Are DAGs properly tagged? Uh, you can actually set logic to make sure that, hey, not only does this DAG run, but is it been structured in a way that is acceptable uh, to my business and to me as a person as well? Um, and then you can see also testing for DAG retries. So you can test to make sure, hey, this has the configuration that I want that I've made sure my company standardizes on. And then you can also bring in logic by saying, hey, you know, make sure this doesn't use unapproved operators. If there's a bash operator in here, raise a red flag, right? Obviously, it's probably a bad example, but you can really just kind of customize and then standardize all your testing logic to make sure that every time you're deploying code, you're deploying it from kind of that shared standardized environment where you know, hey, I know this code is at least passed through this basic level of testing. Now, once you have your local environment set up, I also highly recommend setting up a GitHub environment uh, to also have it linked to that. Um, so that basically you have a record of any changes that are made to your environment. And also you can separate a main branch, which has been tested and approved from development branches. And the reason why you'd wanna have this kind of structure where you see I have a main branch and a test branch is because it gives you a fail safe testing environment. So you can see here in my testing branch, here I can do things like test out crazy new requirements, changing things up, really making drastic op uh, alterations to the project because I know that if it fails, I can just revert back to that main branch and re-pull from that main branch. So you always have kind of that fail safe of, hey, I can go back to and use this branch instead. And so here, what you can do is, you know, if I type in git init, um, this is going to just initialize a git repository within my uh, local machine and then link it to my GitHub account because I'm already signed in. And then what I can do is check, git checkout branch, new branch, and then switch to a new branch. And then any development I make here is re basically revertible until I merge this with my main branch. Um, so 
again, just giving you that peace of mind of saying, hey, you know, I can roll back if I screw things up, but also allowing you to test the things that might really drastically improve your DAG, your pipeline, your environment, because you have that peace of mind that you can go back and revert it and just, you know, get right back on, a on your road. I have a whole other video on setting up kind of more advanced CI CD pipelines, but I really just wanted to make this kind of a quick crash course for setting up a local environment, best practices, and what most people are doing out there in the real world. So hope you enjoyed this video. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Data guy out.